Hi, welcome everyone to the 2022 IWMF Educational Forum. I am Deborah Kelly, and we are excited to bring you the latest information for understanding diagnosis, treatment, and living with Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. I am a WM patient diagnosed three years ago at age 37. I have two children, love to travel and exercise, and rely on doctors to, like Dr. Mattis to keep me around with my family for a long time. I have the honor of introducing Dr. Jeffrey Mattis of the Colorado Blood Cancer Institute in Denver and a longtime friend of the IWMF. Dr. Mattis sees a great many Waldenstrom's patients and is actively involved in targeted research for our rare disease. Now, Dr. Mattis will discuss current treatments, the in, um, current treatments, the latest information about potential new treatments, and how participation in clinical trials help to move the pipeline along for novel therapies. Following the presentation, Dr. Mattis will answer as many of your questions as time permits. Now, please help me welcome Dr. Jeffrey Mattis. Deborah, thanks so much for your very kind introduction. And it's wonderful always to participate in the educational forum. And like most of us, I, I yearn for the day one more when we can do this in person. It's, it has uh, so much energy when we can do that, but this is a great alternative. So I've been tasked with addressing treatment options in WM. And that's a pretty big topic. And luckily later today, Dr. Castillo is going to get more in detail regarding some of the treatments using the BTK inhibitors. But I wanna lay the groundwork here for how doctors think about treatment, what our treatment options are, uh, what's around the corner and so forth. And I invite any of you who have questions to um, uh, please address them. So let's, let's hop right into the talk here. So what are our objectives today? Well, first and foremost is which WM patients require, requ require treatment. Now we're not gonna have time to review some rare uh, WM issues such as Bing Neal syndrome, and I won't talk too much about IgM neuropathy. There's some weird IgM WM syndromes, but this the, the time we have here won't let me go into much detail there. Um, and then for doctors, among all the choices and for patients, how do we decide which treatment to choose? So when I'm talking to a patient about treatment, I, I don't say, boy, we don't have very much here. I say we have a lot from which to choose. How do we decide what's best for you? So how do we do that? And how do treatments differ from initial treatment, that is your very first treatment for WM, versus relapsed WM, that is you've been treated before and the treatment quit working or uh, it worked for a while and then now you've had a relapse, how do we treat relapse disease? And then let's talk about treatments that are established already as well as those that are around the corner, including touching briefly on clinical trials. So critical point, we do not treat smoldering WM patients. You'll probably hear that a bunch during the educational forum, but it's true. The level of IgM and or the percentage of lymphoma cells in the marrow varies tremendously between patients. Some patients with very low IgM levels have lots of symptoms and require treatment, while other patients with very high levels of IgM may not have any symptoms at all. So, a very common second opinion for myself and for WM doctors is for patients who have been diagnosed with WM and their IgM levels are quite high and, and their doctors have said there is an urgent need to treat you as soon as possible because your IgM levels are so high. And that's just not the way it works in WM. So a lot of our second opinions are really uh, reassuring patients who are smoldering that they don't need treatment at the moment. So there is a panel of WM doctors that gets together every once in a while, and they go over what are called consensus recommendations. And, and these are some that have been established now for a couple of decades and really haven't changed. So first, a high IgM level by itself is not a reason to start treatment. Second, if you have anemia, and anemia is measured through hemoglobin or hematocrit, so hematocrit less than 30, hemoglobin less than 10, is generally accepted as a reason for us to initiate treatment. Also, if the platelet count is too low, that can be a reason to initiate treatment. If you have symptoms attribu attributable to your WM, that's a reason to treat. 
And we'll touch on some of those symptoms later, but one example would be uh, fevers and drenching night sweats. If you have hyperviscosity, that is so much IgM in your body that your, that your blood is not flowing well through the blood vessels, that's a reason to treat. If you have severe neuropathy, that can be a reason to treat. Mild neuropathy is generally speaking, we don't treat with WM type chemotherapy. Or if you have rare complications such as cryoglobulinemia or cold agglutinin disease, that those are also reasons for initiating therapy. So from a doctor's perspective, how do we think about treatment? Well, the first discussion that we have to have with our patient is what are the goals of treatment? You know, what's the most important thing for the patient? Is the patient w wanting to uh, get back to work and get back to exercise? Or do they just want their quality of life to improve enough, uh, but please don't make me sick with treatment? And, and from my perspective, I'm always looking at patients and I say, are they young and vigorous or are they old and frail? Because that can influence my treatment recommendation. Furthermore, is my patient interested in fixed duration treatment? That is treatment that goes on for a finite period of time and then stops. Or continuous therapy. That is, you take a treatment until side effects or a recurrence of your M, WM dictate otherwise. Cost is a big factor for some of our treatments to take into account as well. Also, do we have a clinical trial available for our patients? Very often, uh, we have established treatments, but the clinical trials are at the cutting edge where we have treatments that, are, that may be the, the standard of care in a few years. So it's always good to ask about clinical trials. Does mutational status make a difference? And we'll talk a little bit about that later, of course. And then also, do we need rapid control of the disease? Is my patient really symptomatic? We got to fix this right away. Or have they been slowly evolving into some fatigue that we finally decide to treat? And then are we dealing with neuropathy? Because if we're, if we're dealing with neuropathy that's already there before we treat, we should make sure that our treatments don't worsen that neuropathy. So what about a patient's perspective? We just heard the doctor's perspective. So on the left hand here is the patient says, make me better. And also tell me about my options. I want to know about side effects. How will I know if the treatment's working? And please, can we speak the same language? So on the right here is a far side comic that I just love. The doctor's in, in green there, the patient's the dog. And what we say to the dogs, you can all read that. Okay, Ginger, I've had it. You stay out of the garbage. Understand, Ginger, stay out of the garbage or else. And what Ginger hears is blah, 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 Ginger, blah, 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 Ginger. So make sure your doctors are speaking your language and if possible, have them write things down for you. In 2022, we need to learn about mutations. You're gonna hear a lot about that during the educational forum. We're talking about genetic mutations, that is changes in the DNA that are inside the lymphoma cells, inside the blood cells that are acquired. You were not born with these, nor can you pass them on. So these are acquired mutations that you get by chance. The two big ones in Waldenstrom's are MYD88 or MID88, or CXCR4, those are the two big ones. We're learning that these mutations influence how the WM behaves clinically, but also how it might respond to certain types of treatments. For MID88 or MYD88, it's always one specific mutation. It's also called L265P. You might see that in the pathology report. And it's present in well over 90% of patients with WM. And I would say in 2022, for pathology doctors, routine testing of MYD88 when WM is suspected occurs. Now, CXCR4, CXCR4 is quite different. CXCR4 is present in about 40% of WM patients, and there are many different kinds of CXCR4 mutations, and that testing for CXCR4 mutations is much more challenging. And I would say the great minority of pathology doctors and doctors order it when they are uh, evaluating a WM patient. So here's an example of how MYD88 and CXCR4 mutations can affect the clinical behavior and even the response to treatment in WM patients. We're breaking up WM patients genetically into different groups. So on the far left, uh, you see MYD88 mutated and CXCR4 wild type. Wild type is another word for not mutated. So only, this, only the MYD88 mutation, no CXCR4 mutation. That's 60% of WM patients. They have decent levels of IgM, decent levels of marrow involvement, and they're exquisitely sensitive to the BTK inhibitors, such as abrutinib or zanabrutinib. If we go over here in the red circle, this is a patient, a group of patients who have MYD88 mutation, but they also have 
a type of CXCR4 mutation known as a nonsense mutation. These patients have very high levels of IgM, packed marrows, and they don't respond very well to treatments with the BTK inhibitors. And so there are also, there is also a subset of patients with WM who don't even have the MYD88 mutation. Uh, and if you don't have the MYD88 mutation, you don't have the CXCR4 mutation. And they have modest levels of IgM and they really don't do very well with BTK inhibitors. So this is just one way we're using mutations to think about WM and the treatment of WM. So one approach to the treatment of WM has been suggested by a couple outstanding WM physicians who are from Greece. And at the top here, follow me, when patients are diagnosed with WM, we immediately assess the need for therapy and risk assessment. And we distinguish between asymptomatic, that is smoldering disease, and symptomatic disease. Let's go to the right-hand side here for smoldering disease, asymptomatic disease. What do you do? You assess their risk of progressing and you follow them. You do not treat them. For symptomatic patients who are either diagnosed symptomatic or were smoldering before and then become symptomatic, again, we assess the need for immediate disease control. What are your other health issues? What are your comorbidities? What are your preferences? And then we pick a treatment. And those treatments at the bottom here are either fixed duration chemoimmunotherapy, we'll define that shortly, versus continuous therapy. If patients are treated and then they relapse, we go through the exact same exercise. Do you need to be treated right now just because you're relapsing? Many patients don't. What prior treatments have you had? Did you have side effects in your prior treatments? Can we do it again or do we have to look for new treatments? And then we go through the same exercise. So what about treatments in our toolbox? So what we have is the first bullet here, we have BTK inhibitors. And the BTK inhibitors are oral medications and they all end in IB. And so we have a brutinib, xanabrutinib, acalabrutinib. The first two of those have been approved by the Food and Drug Administration. And then we have a new one around the corner that's pretty exciting called pertabrutinib. The second group of drugs that we have are called the monoclonal antibodies. And the one that by far and away is the most utilized is rituximab. And antibodies always end in MAB, by the way, M-A-B. Then we have ofatumumab, which is getting a little more challenging to find. And so, and so we're using a little bit more obinutuzumab than we used to use in the past. We also frequently use what I call traditional chemotherapy. And those are the alkylators, such as bendamustine or cyclophosphamide or the proteasome inhibitors, also called PIs. And examples of PIs are bortezomib, carfizomib, or there's even an oral one called exazomib. And then frequently we include steroids in the cocktail, and the most common steroid used when we're treating WM is dexamethasone. So when we combine an antibody with a traditional chemotherapy agent, we call that chemoimmunotherapy, chemoimmunotherapy. And uh, an example of chemoimmunotherapy would be bendamustine plus rituximab. So another approach to decision-making, and you guys will have copies of these, so we're not gonna go through all this in detail. Uh, again, suggested by the WM docs in Greece, is you have a patient who requires therapy, and if they have peripheral neuropathy, we need to make sure we're avoiding drugs that make peripheral neuropathy is, uh, it makes it worse. If they're not requiring immediate disease control, we can use uh, more mild chemotherapy agents such as DRC, I've defined that at the bottom here, or bendamustine rituximab, or Velcade, or bortezomib dexamethasone rituximab, or even a brutinib with or without rituximab. If we have patients who need immediate disease control and they have bulky disease, then we need chemoimmunotherapy for the most part. And that's usually what I do. I use chemoimmunotherapy when I need immediate disease control. Uh, if you use a brutinib, you can sometimes get quick control, but if I really need it, I go to chemoimmunotherapy. If patients have low blood counts, then certain uh, uh, treatments are more uh, accepted than others. And if we have patients who have immediate IgM reduction needs, that is hyperviscosity syndrome, uh, then what we do is we do plasmapheresis, which is a technique to remove the IgM, but doesn't address the production of the IgM, but temporarily removes it and alleviates the symptoms of hyperviscosity. But then after plasmapheresis, you gotta come in with something definitive to take care of the problem. 
And then you go with either chemoimmunotherapy or a BTK inhibitor with rituximab, with or without rituximab. So, how about bendamustine rituximab? So we know a lot about bendamustine rituximab. And uh, the first thing we know about it is that about 93% of patients respond to bendamustine plus rituximab. And I wonder, I think I might have passed the slide over. I did. So this is an example of chemoimmunotherapy. And Dr. Matthias Remmel from Germany has really been the one who's been uh, shepherding this in, in, into the WM community. And, and he did a very large study where he took patients with Waldenstrom's who were symptomatic needing treatment, gave them all bendamustine rituximab, and then if they responded, which was most patients, they were randomized by the flip of a coin to get some maintenance therapy with rituximab or to just be finished and not take any more treatment. And what do we know from that study? What we know is that 93% of patients responded. With seven years of follow-up, more than half of the patients remained without relapse. And in fact, more than half the patients remained rel without relapse for a predicted nine to 10 years. When maintenance was given, it didn't make a huge difference. So many doctors have largely abandoned maintenance after bendamustine rituxim. And side effects from bendamustine rituxim are mostly low blood counts and a very small risk of permanent bone marrow damage called myelodysplasia or, uh, or in the worst case scenario, acute leukemia. Again, that's a rare, that's a rare thing. So another option for treating with chemoimmunotherapy is bortezomib rituximab. And, and bortezomib rituximab is great treatment. It works quickly, uh, it's very effective. And if you look at the right here, PFS is how long the remissions last. And here, uh, everyone starts off and they're doing okay. And if you have a relapse, then this curve heads down this way. But we're out here, you know, nine, 10 years, many patients still have durable remissions after bendamustine rituxim. On the left of the he slide here, you can see what IgM levels do with the first cycle, second cycle, third cycle, fourth cycle, and on through. And so we know that this is a very effective treatment as well. If you do this, you just have to be, you have to be super careful about peripheral neuropathy. So another, another treatment option that's used much more in Europe than it is here in the States is what I call R R R D RCD or DRC. It's a combination of a steroid called dexamethasone, the monoclonal antibody rituximab, and a traditional chemo called cyclophosphamide. I would say this is a gentle treatment. It's easy to give patients. I included a box here with side effects. And the major thing about the side effects is there, are, there aren't that many uh, with, with, ben, with, with this cocktail. 83% of patients respond. You get six cycles and you're done. And the one thing about this is that responses take a little bit longer than with bendamustine rituxin or with bortezomib rituxin. So occasionally we use rituxin by itself. Now, wh when do we do this? Well, in, in quite frail patients or in patients who have very few symptoms or unu unusual manifestations of WM, such as neuropathy or mild cryoglobulins uh, or sometimes cold agglutinin disease. With rituximab, responses are far fewer and they're much slower to be seen. Now, several years ago, rituxin, rituximab was given most frequently as WM treatment in the United States, mostly by non-WM doctors. And so rituximab used to be the number one treatment administered for WM. That's largely been replaced, but sometimes we still do rituxin in very uh, special situations. On the right-hand side of my slide, you can see that we know that using a brutinib with rituxin is far more effective than, than rituximab alone. And a very large clinical trial was, was done that I'll touch on later called Innovate that compared brutinib plus rituxin versus rituxin by itself. And I'll just spill the beans that the combination of a brutinib plus rituxin was far more effective. So what about BTK inhibitors in WM? And remember the BTK inhibitors are brutinib, xanabrutinib, and acalabrutinib. What we know is that this is continuous therapy. So when your doctor puts you on a BTK inhibitor, it's an oral medication, and it's very effective, it's quite expensive, and the, and the expectation is you're going to be on this until it quits working, 
or until you have side effects that make it impossible to take any more. This is continuous therapy. What we know about BTK inhibitors is again, they work great. So this is a brutinib as initial treatment. And this is for, uh, not for treating relapse disease, but for patients who, for whom their very first treatment is going to be a brutinib. And on the right, on the, on the left-hand side of this sl slide here is response to treatment. And what you can see here for all patients is that almost all patients respond to the treatment. Major responses, that is really significant reductions in the IgM, 87% of the patients. And on the right-hand side of this slide, you can see what happens with IgM levels when you treat with BTK inhibitors. They fall very rapidly and stay low and even continue to fall over months and months and even years of therapy. Conversely, on the, on the bottom part of this slide, these are red blood, this is the hemoglobin or hematocrit level. That is, patients, when they're often treated, are anemic, anemic, and when they get treated, their red blood counts rapidly come up, and patients feel immediately better when they get these BTK inhibitors by, by and large. Now, on the panel B here on the left, you can see the response rates for patients who have a CXCR4 uh, mutation on the right and no CXCR4 mutation on the left. And the major difference here is that patients still respond, but the big responses, that is the really dramatic reductions in the IgM, are far more common in the uh, CXCR4 non-mutated patients than in the mutated patients. So what, we also have a drug called Xanabrutinib that was, that was approved by the FDA about a year ago. And Xanabrutinib is, is also a BTK, BTK inhibitor. And, and, this was, and then there was a study called ASPEN, a very, very important study that compared Xanabrutinib directly head-to-head -head against the Brutinib. And they treated mostly patients who had been treated before for their Waldenstroms, but some of the patients had never been treated before. And, and this is a, well, there's lots in this slide. Again, you'll have copies of the slides, but if you look at the responses here uh, in this box right here on the left, you can see that both drugs worked extremely well for treating Waldenstrom's. And if you look, on, uh, and if you look at the bottom here, this is the big, big, big difference between these two drugs. This is the side effect box here at the bottom. And what you can see here is that for atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter, when the initial publication came out in 2020, 15% uh, of the abrutinib patients had developed atrial fibrillation and flutter versus 2% for xanabrutinib. And so that was the big, big thing that came out uh, with this drug. And in the bottom panel on the right here, you can see a graph of how long it takes to get atrial fibrillation and flutter. And the blue line here is for abrutinib. And so for abrutinib, there's almost a continuous risk of atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter that occurs over the first few, first few years. Whereas with xanabrutinib, it looks like it's, it's uh, pretty mellow and not going up very much. Now, what we always know in Waldenstrom's with, and with cancer treatment in general, that with longer follow-up, sometimes we see more changes. And so the Aspen trial was followed up in a meeting, a blood cancer meeting that we had a few months ago called ASCO, and with longer follow-up and what came out of that study. Well, for xanabrutinib, almost 70% of patients still remain on treatment with xanabrutinib, which is really good. If you look at the major responses, these are complete responses or almost complete responses. It was seen in 36% of xanabrutinib patients versus 22% of abrutinib treated patients. If you looked at the CXCF4 mutated patients, uh, the major responses, 21% for xanabrutinib versus 5% for abrutinib. And the, the important thing is that no matter what treatment you got, even though the responses were different, uh, patients were staying in remission for very, very long periods of time. But again, what we saw is that the side effects differ. Come over here to the right-hand side, and let's look at adverse events, AEs, leading to discontinuation. For xanabrutinib, it was 14% uh, um, on the right here. For abrutinib, it was 19%. How about atrial fibrillation and flutter? 23% now for abrutinib versus 7% for xanabrutinib. So, Xanabrutinib still can cause atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter, but it's quite a bit less than it is for xanabrutinib. Diarrhea looked the same. There was more bruising uh, and, and significant bleeding with abrutinib than xanabrutinib. I, there was more high blood pressure with abrutinib than xanabrutinib. 
uh, a little more muscle spasm. Uh, and so anyway, um, the, the, the differences are still, you know, coming out in terms of side effects between the two treatments and probably some subtle differences in their effectiveness. We know that certain mutations in the CXCR4 can influence how the BTK inhibitors work. And for a brutinib, we know that if you have an MYD88 mutation, but no CXCR4 mutation, the major response rate here in the lower left is about is over 90%. However, if you have a CXCR4 mutation, it can range between 55 and 80%. And so again, the, the drugs still work, but they don't work quite as well uh, as if you don't have a CXCR4 mutation. We've made that point a few times. So let's summarize BTK inhibitors, mostly with the brutinib data here, uh, and look and, and, and for uh, relapsed refractory Waldenstroms. The good is response rates are high. You get rapid increases in hemoglobin and hematocrit, rapid decreases in IgM. There are relatively low rates of discontinuation for side effects. It's effective even in CXCR4 mutated patients. The not so good is that in, in the initial study done by Dr. Treon in relapse WM, the risk of atrial arrhythmia was 13%. And the other thing that, that's unusual about the BTK inhibitors is, is when we use them, we don't clear the lymphoma out of the marrow very much. It's weird. So in many, in many types of cancer, when we have effective cancer treatments, we eradicate a large number of the cancer cells. Now, Waldenstrom's is a non-Hodgkin lymphoma, so these are lymphoma cells called LPL in the marrow. And when we use a brutinib, and when it's really effective at making the IgM go down and making the hematocrit and hemoglobin go up, if we do a bone marrow biopsy on those patients, there's still a lot of lymphoma in the marrow. And so how are these drugs working? I, I, and what I tell my patients is that they don't work by directly so much killing cancer cells, what they do is they sabotage them. They kind of interfere with the machinery and the gear of the cancer cells. And as long as you're giving these BTK inhibitors, you have more or less maimed these lymphoma cells from making the patient sick. But if you take the BTK inhibitor away, usually the machinery gets going again and patients are right back where they started. That's why we give these drugs continuously. So what about treating relapsed WM? Well, most of the time, the initial treatment for symptomatic Waldenstrom's works very well. It's very effective and lasts for years, and that's the good news. And so when, I, when we treat patients, it's quite unusual not to get pretty long remissions, although we have patients that we give our best treatments to where that doesn't happen. This is true for continuous treatment with the BTK inhibitors as well for fixed-duration chemoimmunotherapy. You saw the data earlier from bendamustine and rituximab where it was nine or 10 years before half the patients had evidence of a relapse. However, patients often require a new treatment either because they could not tolerate a particular treatment, that is they couldn't take it anymore because of side effects, or because it didn't work from the get-go, which is unusual, or it was working and then ceased to be effective. And that's what we call relapse WM. When this happens, how do we decide on the next treatment? And so, do doctors, for some reason, and I, I've never liked this term for the many years I've been in this field, they use the term salvage therapy to describe treatment for relapsed cancer in general. And it gets used in the WM community as well. So what are the salvage or next uh, lines of treatment for WM? So here's options for treating Waldenstrom's after the last one quit working or was not tolerated. And I borrowed this slide from our previous speaker, Dr. Maury Gertz. And I, I was going to make my own slide. I said, why should I even do that? He's done all the work and he's, he's the guy. So what did Dr. Gertz say for treating WM in terms of salvage or, re, or, or therapy? Point number one, if you have relapse disease, let's say your IgM was 5,000 and you got treated and it went down to 1,000, you felt great, your anemia got better. And then at some time in the future, your IgM has gone up to 2,000. And everyone's saying, okay, your, your Waldenstrom's is back. Well, are you symptomatic or not? If you're not symptomatic, we don't have to do anything. We can approach that like a smoldering patient. And that's on the right-hand side of the slide here. However, if you're symptomatic, that is you have big lymph nodes or you're anemic again, or your platelets are low, or you're having symptoms, then we need to treat you again. And what I do 
And look at all the treatment choices there are here. I mean, there's Xanabrutinib. Uh, you can, if you didn't use a Brutinib before, you can use a Brutinib. If you didn't use Bendamustine before, you can use Bendamustine again. If you had Bendamustine before, I normally don't use Bendamustine again. I think you have a lifetime limit on that drug. Uh, DRC is a reasonable treatment to use. Dr. Castillo has published on Venetoclax, a new class of drugs that's very effective in, in WM. If you haven't had Velcade before and you don't have neuropathy, you can give Velcade. We still do autologous stem cell transplants in some patients. You can also repeat your original therapy if, if it's reasonable to do. And the other thing to talk about here is clinical trials, the availability, availability of clinical trials uh, in the Waldenstrom setting as well. So these are all things that can be considered and your doctor just has to sit down with you and go over your options. And when my patients relapse, the term I use with them is that we are at a treatment crossroads, a treatment crossroads, we sit down, I write down what they had before, what all the different treatment options are, what are the pros and cons of those, and we make a decision together. So one thing for relapse disease that we know again is that the BTK inhibitors work great. There's a study called Innovate, and on the Innovate trial, there were patients included on the trial who'd had previous treatments for Waldenstrom's and now had recurrent disease, and they and they got uh, and they were and even rituxan wasn't working, and they got a Brutinib. And what we know of that is looking the same graph here. It looks like the other one here. This is the red blood count on the left with the red graph comes rapidly up with treatment. This is the IgM level on the right. It goes rapidly down. And the great majority of patients respond and stay on treatment. The overall response rate was almost 90% for treating recurrent WM in patients who had not had a Brutinib before. And this is another way to look at that. This is the uh, length of the remissions for treating relapse disease with a Brutinib. We're out here to three years in the far right here, and almost all patients are surviving. Now, we have the same data, by the way, with Xanabrutinib. So occasionally the BTK inhibitors, the BTK inhibitors, again, are Brutinib, Xanabrutinib, Acalabrutinib, quit working. And they quit working because the lymphoma cells get smart and become resistant to the drugs. And the most common mutation that we see has this name called C481S, C481S. And when this occurs inside the lymphoma cell, again, by chance, it, it makes the abrutinib or xanabrutinib quit working. And so and this, is, this is a very common mutation. And so it used to be that if patients had this, that we had to switch classes of drugs. So if, if they were on a BTK inhibitor, quit working, you had to go to chemoimmunotherapy. Things are changing, however, here right now. And we have a new drug that's around the corner from FDA approval called pertobrutinib. The, the study name for it is LOXO305, you may have seen that. And pertobrutinib is a different type of BTK inhibitor, it's re, called the reversible BTK inhibitor, and it binds at, at, at parts of the BTK inhibitor away from that C481S, and therefore it works. So last December at our big blood doctors meeting, the Dana-Farber group uh, showed that um, pertobrutinib in the laboratory blocked BTK activity and overcame abrutinib resistance. And a study has gone on around our country that I think will lead to approval of this drug in patients who have who've been previously treated with abrutinib for CLL mostly, but also for some types of non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And there even were a few WM patients included in that study. Let's look at that. So this is pertobrutinib in relapsed refractory B cell cancers. And these are CLL patients, this big group, of mostly CLL patients here. And look at this line right here. If the treatment's working, the line goes down toward the ground, toward the lower part of the slide. This is called a waterfall plot. If it doesn't work, the line goes up, goes the wrong direction. And these are CLL patients in the left, mantle cell lymphoma patients in the middle. And this small group of patients here are Waldenstrom's patients. And you can see the pertobrutinib in abrutinib resistant uh, patients worked pretty darn well in patients. And so this is, a good, this is going to be a great treatment option for our WM patients uh, in the near future. What about managing side effects? So there are side effects on these 
medications are, are real. And I did a talk a few years ago, one of the educational forums on side effects. But what I always tell my patients is when we put you on a treatment, if you have a problem now and you didn't have it before, that we did it to you. Just assume that we did it to you and report those side effects because if we know the side effects and if our nurses know the side effects, we often have remedies for them and we can uh, either modify the dose or suggest remedies to keep people on treatment. I think one of the most important studies to come out of our doctor's meeting last December is the one on the right. I'm, I'm gonna summarize it for you. I, in, the, in the paragraph at the bottom, I'm not gonna show you the data, but one quarter of WM patients in, followed in Boston on a brute and required a dose reduction due to the development of intolerable medication side effects. In the majority of these patients, adverse effects improved or resolved with dose reduction. And importantly, the response, the benefit from the treatment remained stable or improved in almost every patient despite the dose reduction. So don't be afraid of dose reductions. So um, I'm gonna pass over this slide. It's in your handout if you have any questions in the interest of time. Newer treatments around the corner, venetoclax, is a type of drug called a BCL2 inhibitor. It's awesome. I'll show you some data real quick from Dr. Castillo. We also are studying drugs that specifically target the CXCR4 mutation. There are certain drugs that we borrow from multiple myeloma. An example is daratumumab. And then investigators, this is way early, are targeting the inner working of the WM cells in places besides BTK. So lots going on scientifically to develop new treatments. So venetoclax here, uh, basically, this is Dr. Castillo's data uh, in previously treated patients, including those who have had a brute nib and been relapsed or it's not working, works really, really well. This is an oral medication. You give it by itself, but combinations are beginning to be explored. Uh, so look out for this one. The number of studies going on right now, I'm gonna go through these slides very quickly just to show you what kind of research is going on. This is combining a brute nib with venetoclax. So uh, two drugs that work on, on, on treating the WM cell in different ways for previously untreated Waldenstroms. This is Dr. Castillo's trial. This is uh, bendamustine rituximab plus abrutinib. This is a study that we participated in with a CXCR4 inhibitor called Mavericksa4 with abrutinib for patients who harbor CXCR4 mutations. And this is a study looking at a drug borrowed from uh, myeloma called daratumumab plus abrutinib uh, in patients with, with WM. So with that, I'm going to say thank you and close this part of the talk down. Uh, I believe turn it back to Deborah, and then we'll uh, tackle a Q&A session if I'm not mistaken. Hi, thank you so much, Dr. Mattis, for an outstanding overview of both treatments currently available for our patients and therapies in development. We can look forward to hearing more about. I see quite a few questions coming into the queue for you, Dr. Mattis, and so I'm gonna allow you to read over those and engage with those questions. Sure, I think initially I'll, we have lots of time, so I'll go, uh, if it's okay, Deborah, I'll just kind of go in order of the questions. One of the first yeah. questions is, what is the current thinking about the odds of a single course of bendamustine causing a bone marrow damage called myelodysplasia or AML? And the odds of that are extraordinarily low. And if that were to happen, that would be extraordinarily bad luck. I mean, usually we think of bone marrow damage um, from bendamustine occurring after several cycles of bendamustine. So if I had a patient who developed bone marrow damage from a single course, I would go back and look to see if there were any clues about antecedent or pre-existing bone marrow damage before we even started the treatment. I would be thinking about that. So, uh, and we'll tackle our next question right now. The next one is, can treatment reverse neuropathy? So if you have neuropathy caused by WM, it's usually caused by the IgM protein, and the answer is yes. It can improve neuropathy, but I'll also tell you that in my practice, one of the most frustrating things for me and for my patients is when they have IgM neuropathy. If it's long standing and really seated in there, it's really difficult to make that better. 
And so often when we treat IgM related neuropathy, we're trying to keep it from getting worse. Occasionally though, we give people rituxan or gamma globulin to make the neuropathy better. And that is very, very uh, gratifying when that happens. But it can be tough to improve neuropathy when you treat WM. And another the other thing is this, this is a scientific question. There are gene editing techniques. One of those is called CRISPR. It could it be effective for WM at some point? And, and that's a very interesting question um, about whether or not gene editing, for example, uh, for the LT65P mutation might eventually uh, be effective for this disease. Uh, that would be quite a ways off. We are um, looking at CRISPR technology to develop what's called CAR T cell therapy in a disease called myeloma. And a lot of times advances that are made in other cancers to find their way down to Waldenstrom's as well. But that would be a really good question for Dr. Trion, I think. And the next question is, what's considered a high IgM? And the answer to that is yes, uh, or, or we really don't know. So a high IgM is anything above normal qualifies as a high IgM. And so we have high IgMs and really high IgMs. But the real question is not is the IgM high, but is it making my patient sick? That's always the question we have to answer. Not, not what's the absolute level, but is it making my patient sick? So, so whenever I see a patient in clinic and, and I'm following them, uh, and I have my patients get their blood drawn before, before their clinic visit, like a week before, so we have it available during our visit, the patients always say, doc, how am I doing? And what the patient means by doc, how am I doing, is what's my IgM level? And what I always say is, I don't know, I'm not, I, I, tell, I won't know how you're doing until you tell me how you're doing. And then we, then we can go look at the labs. So the IgM level is only a problem in my mind if it's bothering the patient. And here's a, another great question. IgM was found in the kidney tissue on a biopsy that caused chemo treatment. And after being treated, um, the uh, uh, IgM went down real low and there is not very, very much protein found in the urine. So WM can rarely affect the kidney. And it can do it either through putting IgM in the kidney or having the lymphoma cells themselves attack the kidney, uh, or through causing something called amyloidosis. So if the treatment works, then if it, and, and the kidney, if there was protein loss in the urine, if that protein loss went down, the treatment worked. If the kidney blood test called creatinine was high and the creatinine came down, the treatment worked. And so those are ways that we can gauge whether or not it worked. Next question, I'm just going in order here right now. Uh, here's someone who had a blood clot and, and the doctor took the patient off Coumadin and put the patient on Ibrutinib or Ibruvica. And, uh, and the question is, I'm going to read this. Um, let's see. Okay, got it. So this is someone who uh, is on a blood thinner and, and then had it, uh, and, and also the blood thinner was added to Ibrutinib. So Ibrutinib, as you know, causes Bruising, it acts like an antiplatelet drug. And I do have patients who are both on abrutinib and blood thinners. However, if you have excessive bleeding on that, then you have to decide what's the most important thing to do. Do you have to keep the abrutinib going? Should you look at a non-abrutinib treatment? Or does, it, does your patient still need to have full anticoagulation? That's a tricky medical question to decide. And so here's... Uh, a, a, a quite a really good question because it, it makes a really important point in WM. It's, we don't hear about rituximab much anymore as the preferred treatment for WM. Is rituximab by itself an appropriate first line treatment for patients with IgMs of 5,000? And the reason we don't hear too much about rituxan as a preferred treatment for WM is even though it's easy and some patients do great with it, it's it's not nearly as effective as our other treatments. And so our other treatments are far more effective than rituximab by itself in most situations. But there are patients out there who are candidates for rituxan by itself. Now, if your IgM is high, if it's above 4,000 or 5,000, 6,000, and you get rituxan, there is something called IgM flare that's a significant problem for many of these patients where the IgM level actually goes up initially with rituxan. And if you didn't have hyperviscosity before, you can cause it with rituxan for high IgMs. And so I don't think any of us would use rituxan for a high IgM by itself. And if you thought for some reason that you needed to do that, 
you'd have to do plasmapheresis first before you gave the rituxan. So I hope I addressed that question okay. Are there risks associated with plasmapheresis? And the answer is very few, very few risks to plasmapheresis. It does require IVs put in. Sometimes it requires um, uh, a, a central line to be put in. And so you can't have side effects in that, but for the most part, it's uh, um, uh, um, a uh, uh, safe procedure for patients. And so let's look at another question here. Although mutations are required, there must be an innate proclivity that may explain the familial incidence of Waldenstrom. Okay, so uh, this is not really a treatment issue, but we know that if you put a, a hundred Waldenstrom's patients in a room and you go to each and every one and take a very detailed family history, very detailed family history, in at least 20 of those Waldenstrom's patients, you'll find a first degree relative who has either Waldenstrom's or a disease closely related to Waldenstrom's like chronic leukemia or chronic lymphoma. And so there are other mutations, of course, that are predisposing to that. And there's a Dr. Mary McMaster, she's spoken at this educational forum many times. And this is a key, this is her research, and she is the expert on this and, and, and would love any samples from anybody who has a family member who's close to you who also has a blood cancer. So there are other mutations there, and she's more, much more capable of speaking to those than I am. Um, and can abrutinib be called a blood thinner since it increases the risk of bleeding? The answer is yes. So when I give people abrutinib or xanabrutinib, I tell them this is like taking a baby aspirin. And so if you're having surgery, for example, you have to talk to your doctor about whether or not you need to hold your BTK inhibitor around the time of your surgery. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. So it does, uh, it is a blood thinner. So here's a patient here who has a very unusual presentation of WM with enlarged lymph glands, which on biopsy show lymphoplasmocytic lymphoma, but the, but the bone marrow had very little lymphoma in it and the IgM is really, really high. And so the doctor wants to treat even though the patient's asymptomatic. So do, when do we treat for this type of patient? So the thought is if the lymph nodes are big enough where they're irritating the patient or look like they, they could be irritating major organs, then that's a reason to treat. That's on the consensus guidelines. But if lymph nodes are small and your IgM, if it's 5,000 or 1,000, if you don't have any symptoms, then you're still smoldering and don't necessarily need to be treated. So if your doctor wants to treat you, that's a good time to consider uh, maybe a second opinion. Okay, so here's a, a question here that I think relates to allergic reactions with rituximab. So when we use chemoimmunotherapy, we use uh, usually rituximab. And for some reason, WM patients, unlike the other non-Hodgkin lymphoma patients out there, have a much higher chance of having an allergic reaction to rituximab. At least one in six, in my, in my opinion, have a tough time getting rituximab. And so many of you, I'm sure, have had this happen where you're in the doctor's office, you get the rituximab, next thing you know, you're chilling, you're shaking, your blood pressure goes down, everyone runs in your room, they stop the infusions, and they go through an exercise trying to give it and so forth. So if people have allergic reactions to rituximab, sometimes you can still give the rituximab with aggressive pre-medication slowing it down. Other times we have to switch the rituximab to one of those different antibodies, such as obinutuzumab or ofatumumab. I'll keep going, there's some great questions here. Um, is a brute, <laughs> I'm not gonna tackle that one, okay, so, uh, does WM or disease cause intestinal bleeding or iron deficiency? And the answer is, um, if people are on blood thinners, that can cause iron deficiency from small amounts of blood loss in the colon. But for, for, for some reasons, WM patients have much lower iron levels than non-WM patients. There's a, there's a mechanism for this uh, that, 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 that does that, that looks at that. But uh, we, whenever I see a WM patient with, with anemia, I always check iron levels because WMers have far more uh, uh, low episodes of low iron than non-WMers. Um, 
I'll keep going through some. Okay, this is a question I touched on in my talk, which is if patients who had negative side effects with the BT, BTK inhibitors do well on lower doses, and the answer is absolutely, absolutely they do. And so, again, when we use BTK inhibitors to treat patients, if you're on a brutinib 420 milligrams or xanabrutinib 320 milligrams um, and you're having side effects, what we do is we lower the dose. And when we do that, almost all the time, the side effects improve and the WM stays under good control. So always be talking to your treatment team. If you need dose modifications, get the dose modifications. Another great question here is what combination therapy might be the most promising for the future? And I think borrowing from some of the, of the other blood cancers, if we can use things like BTK inhibitors and venetoclax or chemoimmunotherapy and treat patients with Waldenstrom's to very deep remissions, but for a fixed duration period of time, that would be fabulous in my opinion. Wouldn't it be great to be able to treat people super effectively and give them long treatment breaks where you don't need to be on treatment forever and ever and ever. I think that's gonna be the, the real key in the future for treating WMers. The other thing I think that's going to happen is some of our WMers do have more difficult to treat disease. And we're learning from other blood cancers that we have a lot of treatments that where we activate our immune cells called T cells to do the cancer killing. Uh, and examples of these are called uh, T cell redirecting antibodies or CAR T cells. And as these make their way into WM patients to treat the more difficult to treat patients, that's also, in my opinion, going to have a huge, huge benefit for our patients. And here's a question. This is a good question, too, about should you have CXCR4 testing done to guide your treatment? And if you want to see doctors argue, at a WM meeting, uh, ask that question because some docs like to always test for CXCR4 and then counsel their patient about if the BTK inhibitor is right for them or how, how it might work. Other docs take a more pragmatic approach. They'll say, I don't need to know what the CXCR4 is. I'm going to give you the same treatment anyway. And if I give you a BTK inhibitor, it works great. I know you didn't have a CXCR4 mutation. If I gave you a BTK inhibitor and it took forever to work and sort of worked partially. I know you probably had a CXCR4 mutation. And so I think in the future, the CXCR4 mutation will just be done automatically, but I wouldn't necessarily go out of my way to have it tested unless it was needed, for example, to um, determine eligibility for a clinical trial. But I know other doctors would disagree with me on that, but that's just what I do in my practice. So the, another question is, how about patients who don't have the MYD88 mutation? Are there treatments that are best for those patients? And the answer is yes, chemoimmunotherapy. So I use chemoimmunotherapy for my patients who truly don't have an MYD88 mutation. However, if you've been told you don't have an MYD88 mutation, it's possible you do, and it was missed by the testing. And so there are what we call false negative MYD88 tests that go on. And these can occur depending on the methodology used for the MYD88 testing. And patients who have very small amounts of lymphoma in their marrow very often can be missed for MYD88 testing also. So if you've been told you're wild type, a really good question to ask is, am I really wild type? Could they have missed the MYD88? But if you truly are a wild type that is non-mutated for MYD88 patient, then you get chemoimmunotherapy in my opinion. There are some great questions here. You just can't tackle them all. Um, a, a smoldering patient wants to know if they need to be tested for CXCR4. I would say I would not go out of my way to do that. But when you need to be treated, it would be reasonable to do a Merrill and consider CXCR4 testing. Um, here's another. This is a, this is a not infrequent problem in WM. Some WM patients get lymph nodes that grow in the middle of their chest and obstructs the flow of the fluid through the chest and fluid accumulates inside the lungs. That's called a pleural effusion. And this pleural effusion sometimes even looks milky. Um, and so this is a, uh, these pleural effusions are, can be complications of WM. And in my mind, 
those patients almost always need chemoimmunotherapy to to shrink the lymph nodes enough to get the pleural effusions to go away. That's just that's my opinion. Other doctors may have a different opinion that, than that. Another patient has asked, what's the difference between mild, moderate, and severe neuropathy? Mild, I would categorize, and we, we, we can grade these. So you can go into what's called the National Cancer Institute Common Toxicity Criteria, and they'll grade one, grade one two, and three peripheral neuropathy. Grade one is tingling only. Uh, that's, that's not bad. Grade two is uh, more significant tingling that might be impacting your, your, your day-to-day things, like your ability to, to button something. Uh, might be affected. Uh, and then you can have grade two with pain where you get shooting episodes of pain. That's more severe. And when you get above that to grade three, then you're talking about having your gait affected or your muscle strength affected. So mild, moderate, severe. Uh, does BTK work in, on amyloidosis? My, the answer is not very well. So if someone has amyloidosis associated with IgM or WM, those patients need, in my opinion, chemoimmunotherapy. Usually bendamustine rituxan. If they don't have neuropathy, you can use Velcate rituxan. Um, here's another patient asking about single agent rituximab as first line treatment. And for that, I have a couple patients in my practice who do great with a little rituxan every three or four years. There are those patients in your practice. So if you're one of those people who took rituxan, it worked great. And, and now it's three years later, you need to be treated again. You bet, get rituxan again. There just aren't very many of you that are really like that. But it's great when that happens. Um, there, there are new non-covalent inhibitors. I've had a few questions about uh, nemtabrutinib, I don't know anything about nemtabrutinib. I haven't studied, studied unless it's called Arcule. We're studying one called Arcule, and I don't know, I don't know, don't know if that's the same drug or not, but uh, it, that one looks good, uh, the one that we're studying, but I'm, I'm not sure of, of that name. Um, I think at this point we're coming up on the hour, Deborah, and I'm going to turn it back over to you. And if there's anything we didn't address that you think I need to address, we have a couple of minutes maybe. All right. Uh, wonderful question and answer session following your incredibly informative presentation, Dr. Mattis. We genuinely appreciate you joining us and sharing your knowledge and answering our questions today. IWMF would like to extend our gratitude to this year's educational forum title sponsors, Bygene, Pharmacyclix, and Janssen, as well as Select Cell Ector Biosciences, the Treadway Foundation, and X4 Pharmaceuticals. We thank all of you in the audience and would ask you to complete a quick survey when it comes up on your screen. Just a reminder that the IWMF Networking Lounge is open until 3.20 U.S. Eastern Time to stop by and join a hosted community conversation. To view the next session, close your webcast, navigate back to the theater tab at the top of your screen and select the red live now button. Thank you again, Dr. Mattis.